Good evening. I'd like to call to order the board meeting for 6 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday, September 26, 2017. Can we have a roll call, please, Mr. Alexandrovich? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Witkowski? Here. Mr. Gamble? Here. Mr. Nielsen? Here. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. Uh, I am here, and Mrs. Larson is excused. Thank you. The meeting has been properly posted. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Item three, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Motion by Mrs. Witkowski. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Nielsen. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item four is community comment. Per board policy, we allow up to 15 minutes of resident discussion. Is there any community comment tonight? And, okay, if you can come up to the microphones with the, and give us your name and address, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan McAdams. I live at 8150 South River Lane. Uh, my daughter attends Rottenwood Elementary School. Um, I just want to bring up a uh, discussion that was brought up at our local PTO meeting um, and want the board to give a little bit of explanation on the um, adjustment of the curriculum, putting extra emphasis on um, literacy and taking away from the, the arts and the music program. Um, we're hearing from a lot of our children that by the time they get into the arts room, in the music room, by the time they get their assignment, their supplies, it's time to clean up because we've trimmed uh, time from those programs. I think we are going in a wrong direction. Um, this school board, this school district has promoted how great its literacy programs are, how great the test scores are. So to then take a, a different course on a, a program that takes away from other things, which most studies show arts and music are one of the most important things to have in the curriculum. So to now be trimming it and taking out 10 minutes uh, at a time and making it hard for our children to enjoy it and for the teachers to teach it um, is a little bit uh, of a question mark to me and many other parents. Uh, I'd like to know from the school board why this was done, what the, you know, what's, you know, what's behind this and what is gonna be done to correct it because this is going to be a growing problem. This was brought up in our PTO meeting and it, the room ignited on this. So I'd just like to hear from the school board what the situation is. Okay, at community comment, the board does not interact with, with the community, but because we have, um, okay. we have a, it's, it's not, it's not an uh, agenda item, but we are talking about um, a curriculum review process tonight. So um, I will ask Mr. Reuter if he can give an, a small explanation. We can't go into a full agenda item on it because it's not an agenda item, but okay. we'll and address it briefly. I would, I would make, like, make a request to add that agenda item to the next um, board meeting. Or tell me how I go about getting something on the agenda so that we can have okay. this discussion. Okay, agenda. From what I understand, this has been asked to be on the agenda by other parents and has not been like, included. No, I've not heard that request, but the board. I'm, I'm hearing it from behind me, yeses, 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 so. <laughs> an agenda item to the board? No, not to okay. the board. Um, and the board decides what will be an agenda item, and um, I, I can't give you the answer right now. Okay. okay. It's, not, it's not on our agenda tonight, so. Then how do we go about getting it on the agenda? Okay, I've heard your request, so um, I'll see if a board member or two want to have that on the agenda, but uh, first I'd like to hear from Mr. Reuter um, during the meeting on that okay. issue. Thank you for your comment. Is there any other comment? Any other community comment? <coughs> Hearing none. I'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there any board member that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Motion by Mrs. Witkowski. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gamble. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item six, school board announcements. Do we have any announcements? I would just like to remind the board that the foundation has a consignment sale uh, October 7th pass the word and also they have their Grand Slam Gala November 18th in November so also keep that in mind. 
Thank you. And I also want to offer a little observation. Uh, this weekend I happened to be in Algoma, Wisconsin, and I happened to notice that there were several billboards advertising your local public school, which I thought was pretty amazing. Just sharing that. Thank you. Any other announcements? What uh, time uh, oh. tomorrow? Or are we talking about that later? No, did Dr. Miller right. is providing the card. Do you want to say anything about um, oh, yeah. parade? Oh, parade, parade tomorrow? Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, yep, we have a car for the parade, and we're meeting on Hunt Huntington Park. Park. Uh, be there at 5.30 tomorrow. Okay. And just candy? Uh, candy, lots candy. of candy. Mm -hmm. Are we dressing in theme? Spirit wear. Spirit wear. Or, or around okay. the world if you want to. Go around the world? Okay. That's the theme. Okay. All right. Any other announcements? I think Thank tomorrow's you. theme is tourist. Today was country of origin. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's theme is tourist. So if you'd like to come as a tourist. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. Okay. School board calendar. We have a regular board <coughs> meeting on Wednesday, October 11th. 2017 here at the Education and Community Center at 6 o'clock p.m. and a regular board meeting Wednesday, October 25th, 2017 here at the ECC at 6 o'clock p.m. School board liaison reports, item 8A, personnel and policy, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Um, we have two policies before you, policy 5375, which is ensuring the educational stability of children in out-of-home care, and policy 5120, uh, 5122, admission of expelled students We'll start with 5375, and Dr. Miller, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, but this is a brand new policy. It's in response to the, the DPI uh, and local school districts are required to adhere to Title I. Um, sub A, which is uh, part of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, the new Title I provisions uh, now reinforce and, and complement similar provisions in the Social Security Act. Um, and they require that child agencies collaborate with local schools uh, for the same purpose of benefiting children. Um, this policy is mandatory. It is a new policy, um, and hopefully everyone had a chance to review it. It's fairly straightforward, um, but I would make a motion to approve 5375. Is there a, we have a motion by Mr. Lewis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Nielsen. Any discussion? Um, it, it does talk about uh, the district's primary point of contact. Mm -hmm. Who is the district's primary point of contact? So. Um, Ms. Preman would oversee, but she would assign a primary point of contact and likely would be a social worker. Okay. Thank you. It, the policy um, indicates that we have to coordinate with the county. Correct. So from what I understand, the county notifies us Correct. when there's a foster child. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any more discussion? And how many foster kids do we have in our uh, it varies from year to year, so um, the policy really does ish, um, speak to students who are residing outside the Franklin District. Those are the students that we're looking at to, um, because you know we're the school of origin, so we are responsible for coordinating with the agency to make sure students can at continue to attend Franklin School District when they're in out of district placement. Um, with the family. So last year we had just a, a couple of students. Um, this year currently we don't have any. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. We have a motion by Mr. Lewis and a second <coughs> by Mr. Nielsen. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. Uh, thanks. So finally, policy 5122, which is admission of expelled students, which is fairly relevant um, to some previous discussions. So this, this is a simple review. Um, it was last reviewed in 1995. Um, and as Dr. Miller has indicated in the literature, it's uh, suggested that we reconfirm. don't touch it, but reconfirm. reconfirm. Mm -hmm. okay. So I would make a motion to reconfirm policy 5122. Motion by Mr. Lewis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gamble. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extension motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is item 8B, board liaison <coughs> reports. Do we have any reports tonight? I met with Mr. Volo today at the high school, first of many visits, I hope. So we had a chance to walk around and see some of the kids in action. I saw Valley over there. And um, mm -hmm. so um, 
I just met with them this afternoon. I really didn't have a chance to do a write out on it, but uh, but I'll have something for the board later. But it was good to, to meet him and kind of get pick his brain a little bit on what some of what he thought some of his challenges might be coming into a new district. And, and pretty much he's just in information gathering mode right now and getting to know, trying to get to know as many people as he can. So, but I uh, we went into a couple classrooms and it was good. Good, thank you. All right, then we'll move on to reports and presentations. Item 9A, the instructional services report, curriculum review process, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Reuter. And Mr. Reuter, when you feel it's appropriate, if you could address that issue. Definitely, thank you. Um, as we shared in our report, we gave you a little background on previously the curriculum review process that the district engaged in, a five-year cycle process in, process in 2014-15 school year. Um, instructional services shifted that to a more annual process to look at um, minor changes over the course of a year-to-year -year basis. Um, with that being said, Mr. Cohn and I spent some time with Dr. Miller this summer talking about um, our review process and the rate of change and the speed at which we may have been changing um, work from a curricular lens and, and thinking about going back to a more concrete plan um, that we can better, as you see, the five-stage process that Mr. Cohen and I have outlined that better helps with understanding from an HR lens, staffing and long-term goals from a business lens, looking at a curricular aspect of purchases, um, short-term and long-term, as well as being very transparent to the teaching staff so they're understanding this is when my discipline or area is up for review. Here's the process we go through to ensure that we're making change, not at a rapid pace, but as we talk about Franklin Public Schools being a better place to learn, we think about that change as a result of study and action. So as you'll see in stage one and two, it really stage one is an analysis stage where Mr. Cohn and myself with other stakeholders across the district analyze the current state of <coughs> a given discipline and program or program and from there analyze what we're doing well in areas we need to improve based on both qualitative and quantitative data, study what other districts may be doing, what does current research suggest, and then from there, the following year, we come up forward with an action plan and professional development of our teachers to better understand how we're going to implement a new curriculum. So I'll give the example of K-12 math. Last year, we spent the year studying our math data trends over the course of the last decade and from there, we saw areas that we are successful in and areas we need to improve in. Um, we came out of that process, as I shared at the last board meeting, around um, one of the areas was we look at, we're look, going to be looking at is our acceleration process, and that tied into our gifted review that we went through. So from there, this year, we are in stage two, and we're over, that work's being overseen by myself, the math system specialists, coordinators, and teacher leaders, program educators that we've talked about previous to, and the compensation model. I'm just, and who are the program ed educators? Who are, who are those? Those are teacher leaders who apply for positions as they arise in curricular in different stages of this process. So this year we have three program educators in the area of math spanning from grades 5 to 12 that assist in developing the action plan for implementation. So it's a here. role, it's not a position. Correct, correct. And under this stage too, you also talk about qual quality data sources that you're going to use? Are these like new data sources or, and we have a lot of data already. So when we talk about quantitative data, that's the data that usually Mr. Cohn presents to the board. We look at ACT forward results, our local assessment data, and trends over time. Qualitative data is talking to teachers and listening sessions. Um, when we implemented writer's workshop at the elementary level, I spent time at each building interviewing teachers on what are we doing well in writing as a district and where are areas we need to improve. Likewise, the same came um, out of the implementation this year of Reader's Workshop. What are the areas of success and where are the areas that we're lacking? Data tells one story from a number, but behind every number is a child and another story, and teachers are the ones working with those children every day. So their input into this is what's working in literacy and what's not is also weighed in factoring our actionable goals for stage two as we develop an action plan and further professional development for teachers. So out of our math root cause review last year, um, the teaching team that was comprised that volunteered to be a part of this committee um, developed some action plan and items that we're putting into place this year as well as feedback around what instruction, um, professional development they really wanted to engage in to become more skillful teachers in the area of math instruction. So I guess I'm imagining you, but you survey teachers as to how it's working, and maybe they say it's really working, it's, you know, different, there's a range of scoring, and then you come back to that, 
and survey again, or you're just doing a one that is, that, that is one approach. Last year we engaged in five different sessions where we talked around different themes that quantitative data suggested we needed to talk about, but then we asked teachers to engage in conversation and synthesis around what they're actually seeing in the classroom in areas that were needed for concern. Then from there, the smaller team of approximately 20 individuals, that information went out to the rest of the math department who then weighed in or shared with those point people their thoughts, they brought that back to Mr. Cohn and myself and we continued to grow that conversation. But does it ever come down to we need to focus on like these particular things, like we need more of this and less of this, or is it just again a conversation yeah. as opposed to a... So if you reference page five under K-12 math, you'll see the three areas that the team determined as focus for year two. So that's content and standard prioritization and progression K-12, assessment methodologies and rubrics, and process of student acceleration and intervention. So through multiple dialogues and synthesis of those dialogues as well as standardized data, that's what the math department determined as an area of stage two focus for this year. So on the professional development days throughout the course of the school year, we will focus on, on these three key areas as we look to probably implement and or pilot new curriculum next year at the K-12 level for math. Did you, want, did you have more to finish I on kind your of, presentation? Or I could, just yeah. before we lead into that as kind of a segue, previous to the one academic year per stage, what was the structure of this review? Um, previously, so prior to 2014-15, please wait, yep. Mr. Cohen, there was a five-year cycle that type similar to this. So it was just like topics every five years, so one could potentially sit idle for five? Correct, yep. correct. And, and now we're basically saying every topic, subject area is going to be touched with every, potentially every year, but in a different stage of that and process. And a different level of depth, so that we're not waiting five years and now we've missed the vote on what new standards might be available. We're not coming to the board every five years for a new course at the high school when there's a need for a new course approval. Okay, from year two. It just year. allows us to be more responsive while also having a clear process in place that people can count on in terms of that progression. Okay, so related to the community concern of, of the art curricula, it's currently at stage four. So this, this program was rolled out and th this stage process was rolled out in 14, 15. Yeah, so the, so the charts that you see on, on three and four, yeah. because we had that couple year gap where we went from a five year process to an every year process, uh, Mr. <coughs> Royer and I had to identify, you know, based on the work that's occurred over the last five years, where we felt these areas fit. And then we did our best to kind of place them into that five year progression. Where they were in their developmental cycle. Correct, okay. based on the work that had been taking place over the last five years, both in that five year cycle and out of that five year cycle. So um, we used our, our best professional judgment to kind of place those, which is why you see some of those uh, areas in stage three, four, and five. And I, I don't know if you're going to continue through the st stages, but you have that rapid cycle feedback. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Yeah, it really allows us to be responsive, right? So whereas in stage one, we're engaging in a lengthy year-long study of all of that uh, data and all of that uh, feedback that we're collecting, uh, the, the years three, four, and five are, are designed to make smaller changes, but responsive changes, right? So rather than identifying maybe a number of significant areas of study that we need to action plan around, maybe there's just a small area within that subject area that needs to be addressed. This allows us to, to adjust it and make that change uh, more frequently and in a responsive way without having to engage in a lengthy study around it. So larger scale changes take place in years one and two, and then smaller scale change in three, four, and five. I can speak to the concerns brought forward by Mr. McAdams, and, and I hope I said your last name correctly, and um, the concern from the Robinwood parents. As we implemented Writer's Workshop last year, we looked at um, what needed to be accomplished in literacy to align our curriculum, and I've shared this in the past, align our curriculum K-8 and ultimately K-12 as we are running on a different curriculum at the elementary level, K-6, that did not align to 7-8, that did not align to 9-12. So you think about the journey of a child through their literacy career, um, they might be using different terminology and different types of learning uh, to accomplish the mastery of the standards at each grade level. So last year, as we implemented Writer's Workshop and looked at and got feedback from teachers on what was working and what wasn't, one of the things that wasn't um, was a concern for teachers was feeling they at the in the literacy classrooms was feeling they had to get everything in and there wasn't adequate time and there wasn't equity of time 
though we have the same instructional minutes at every elementary school, the blocks of time because of different schedules and different start times and different demographics of the buildings, we're not allowing for a flow of large chunks of time for not just literacy, but math instruction as well. So through um, studying our comparable districts in the CISA 1 region that perform at the level or above the level that we do, as well as looking at what teacher feedback was around developing common planning, planning time so teachers could work together with special ed teachers as well to plan around student needs in both literacy and math. Um, it was determined um, that we would reduce time in art as well as physical education. And ultimately physical education was two days a week previously, 45 minutes per session. And now we've, we've more aligned with the recommended state statute that we're three times a week and students have physical education three times a week, 30 minutes um, in each of those sessions. And then in our classes we reduce to two 30 minute sessions in some buildings at K123. They're um, 60 minute blocks for the younger kids as they, they have it once a week for 60 minutes because of transition. Um, but building principals had autonomy around building those schedules as well as some decided to choose to make the four, five, six classrooms, 60 minutes, depending upon what they felt in court, coordinating that with their um, art teachers. Music was not touched this year as we gave music a year to analyze where they were from a curriculum aspect, what needed to be condensed with the thought that we would move forward to consistency in those three encore areas of um, reduced time next year. So um, that's that was the rationale for that change. Again, we looked at comparables around what other districts in the CISU 1 region um, are offering for Encore Times. We looked at state statute and what our requirements are and made sure we aligned with that. So ultimately it gave our principals more flexibility to develop co-planning and collaborative time for their teachers to work around imp implementing a new reading curriculum is one of the main things as reading is the foundation, literacy is the foundation of education. So with that, teachers said they needed more time and feed, um, collaboration time around word work, read aloud, and ensuring the fidelity and growth of our programming in both reading and writing and speaking and listening. So to, to touch on something you just mentioned, a student at Ben Franklin could have physical education three days a week at 30 minutes a slot. That, that's consistent across the district. Yes. But in art education, Ben Franklin could have one day a week at 60 minutes versus uh, Robin Wood, Pleasant View, whatever, having two days at 30 minutes. Correct. Correct. That was dependent that was upon dependent on the building. I can ask our principals to share what that might look like because I can't explain every building schedule off the top yeah. of my head. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they still all have the same amount of time. Right. Okay. It's just, uh, yeah. Oh, sure. just well, I'm the principal of Ben Franklin. So, um, <laughs> K12. Dr. Miller, can I ask about um, if the Robin Wood parents would like more discussion on this, that perhaps you and um, the teaching and learning directors could meet with them, possibly, so that we possibly through Mr. Nelson? Mm -hmm. And just like any change that gets implemented, this is something that gets looked at and get feedback just like they provided, and they'll, keep, they'll ask their teachers how it's going, and you'll keep getting feedback, and so this is something that is a process. I would assume parent comment would be a form of rapid cycle feedback. It is. Yeah. It is. I've had, you know, as we talk about literacy as well, I've had many conversations with parents across the district around classroom libraries and how PTOs are helping support the growth of the literacy programming. And um, yeah, we, we encourage that feedback. I have a question about um, <clears throat> stage one and stage two. Um, 
where this description at the top talks about the district-wide stakeholder team. Can you explain who's in the district-wide stakeholder team? Yeah, uh, it, it kind of differs a little bit by area, right? So I'll use two examples. The first is personalized learning. So this past week, we sent a memo out to our whole staff kind of laying out the, the goals for our personalized learning year of study and what that might look like, along with some dates and times uh, for a district committee around that work. Uh, so the personalized learning team uh, is primarily going to be made up of uh, teachers, administrators, uh, system specialists, uh, and other staff who have uh, vested interest in that work and have a, uh, a desire to, to participate in that process. The Education for Employment team, which is moving into year two, for example, though, uh, is made up of, of those same individuals as well as uh, community partners, uh, representatives from higher ed, so uh, parents, students. So we try to identify based on the committee and the topic uh, who those stakeholder groups might be, and then we invite them to participate in the process. And it, and it may differ by subject area or by program. So I spoke to you once before about a board member being on community district-wide, yep. so is that still something that is in place, that will be in place? Yeah, we'll be looking for a board member to participate in the Education for Employment Committee, for example, and um, obviously you're going to have a conversation with Ms. Larson about that being mm -hmm. our liaison, so. Uh, thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, yes, question, um, on page one you have the topics, I guess, because mm -hmm. uh, it's not and you have personalized learning, high school systems of support, and education for employment. Those aren't curriculum areas, are they? You know, what what are they, and how do you pick these? Great question, yeah. So um, page five really provides the description of those areas and what we're exploring there. Um, you know, these are, you know, the two charts. The first chart is really broken down by departments. The second, and curricular area, the second chart uh, really breaks down by program, right? And programs tend to touch the entire district or at least multiple curricular areas. Uh, and so the way things broke down for us this year, Mr. Reuter uh, primarily took the curricular departmental areas and I took the, um, the programmatic areas that are kind of touching those other pieces. Um, personalized learning, obviously everyone has a, a stake in personalized learning, right? The, the sorts of strategies that connect to that methodology touch every subject area and every grade level and uh, every student and every teacher. Um, the systems of support review is going to look at both Saber Academy, so our alternative program at the high school, uh, and then our other support structures at the high school beyond the realm of universal instruction. So uh, as we look at needs uh, of students, um, both through an alternative program lens uh, and through uh, a series of other lenses, we'll, we'll try to identify, you know, what is that menu of supports we're providing students who are struggling uh, academically or social emotionally, and, and how are we continuing to support them through that process? So that, that team will, will kind of work through where are we at with that and what might we build towards the future. Is that, uh, how does it relate to um, special education, those things, and we have a whole special education department, so how does that? Yeah, they all connect directly to special education, right? Personalized learning, when we think about uh, an IEP for a student, right, that it's very personalized, right? It's identifying the specific needs of the child and how we might meet those needs in terms of accessing the curriculum. When we think about systems of support. This is have, broader than that, correct? It is broader than that, certainly. But it, it, these, these, these touch all curricular areas, yeah, including special education. Under, um, I, we're going to go through the rest because I have more specific questions. Yeah, so, so I'll just touch on education or employment. Obviously, you were part of the report last year and the, the work that that team had done. Um, this year, we're going to bring that team back together and we're going to look at academic and career planning uh, and, and kind of touch on how that, that work is going in terms of uh, um, that experience for our students in grades 5 through 12. Uh, and then also we're going to continue to work on our expansion of community-based experiences. And when we think about education for employment, that touches obviously our career and technical education areas. So we're continuing to build capstone experiences in business and face. Uh, and then in tech ed, uh, we're looking at our accelerator lab and attaching a course to that. And obviously we're also continuing to overhaul our metals manufacturing program. So, so a lot of uh, curricular areas and courses tied directly to this work. But again, it's programmatic, so we're looking a little broader than that in terms of the overall work of those teams. So it talks about skills and habits a lot too. Skills and habits. What what, do you, what does that mean to you? Skills and habits, and what how that plays into our curriculum areas. Yeah. So the Department of Public Descri uh, Instruction defines a college and career ready student as having the knowledge, skills, and habits that they need to be successful beyond high school. Uh, so uh, it, you know. 
in terms of, of those skills and habits, right, those skills are what we think of commonly as employability skills, right, things like critical thinking, collaboration, problem solving, perseverance. Uh, and that, you know, those skills are something that needs to be explicitly taught and connected to the application of, of the knowledge that we're teaching in the classroom environment so that students are pre prepared for college and career. And then habits, you know, obviously things like leadership, uh, you know, the ability to, to, you know, meet deadlines and get work completed, those kinds of things are, are habits that we want to build and instill in our students as well. So would we, I'm just thinking outside the box here, but, you know, a driver's license is kind of critical for career success. We used to have driver's ed in high school, but it's not long. as well. Not if you live in an inner city that has. I mean, a lot of people in Chicago don't even have a license, I, right? I, I mean, it's I, I, I'm glad you, you said that. But really, right. when you think about it, that license is more than just the ability to drive. It's well, right. It's on an application, every application that you fill out, and it, it's probably a differentiator between whether you're going to move ahead in the employment process or not. So it's much more than the ability to operate a vehicle. And I'm not asking anyone to hear the, you know, comments now, but I'm just making an observation that it is a important element in employment. So, and we can move on if somebody else wants to share with us. I would agree with that, but you also have work permits for individuals that are in the age group they can't drive. Um, so I think the DPI identifies employability skills. That the skills and habits language comes directly from their direction of someone that is employable has the skills and habits to become employable. It's a kind of a circular argument, right? So um, I agree with you that having a license might be a barrier to employment or a gateway to employment, but it's not necessarily an employability skill. You know, the driver's ed program, I don't even know if, they're, if they teach the courses at the high school anymore, or, or someone can come in and actually use the space. It's offered, but but, but I, th I think I think that because the literature is provided to high, to those kids that are at driving age or or the the um, the permit age. Mm -hmm. So I mean I think I think you have to think of it almost as a gateway to potential employment. It can be a barrier without it for potential employment. But in order to build on the skills and habits that the DPI the DPI is requiring, it's truly the employability skills of leadership, of organization, of time management. I think mm -hmm. those are what the skills and habits the DPI has recognized. So although I, yep. I don't there's disagree DPI with you. And there's, our, there's our local discussion here. Right. So I, don't, I don't disagree with you, but I okay. think the way that, uh, <coughs> um, that we've looked at the employability skills, I think, is based on the core foundation of those skills being the skills that can be taught K-12. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your comments. And then um, <coughs> 12 math. You know, you got those three items there, content, standard prioritization, progression. You know, what, what does that look like? You know, what, can you give me a, more examples on what exactly you're doing in, under those topics? Sure. So as we look at standards that are approved by the school board, um, and we look at college and career readiness standards. I'm talking about the K-12 math. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm, and so we look at, we have a lot of standards and how do I teach all of that and what's the most important and what are we measured on as a district, um, as a state. So we, we need to think about going deeply into standards rather than we're going to touch every single standard and spend one day on it and there's no transfer of knowledge over time. And then we start finger pointing of, well, you never taught that in fifth grade and that's why they don't know it in seventh grade and that's why they're not doing well in the ACT. So by taking all of the standards that we've adopted as a district and prioritizing where those will fall within the scope and sequence of K-12 and how they'll progress over time because the root of all of standards have the same language. They just get more complex as we go over time. So how, if we think about something like algebraic thinking, is that a strand of the Common Core and ACT, how are we instilling that understanding and knowledge all the way down to kindergarten? How does that progress through our course development at the high school level? And how do we build a progression over time instead of, I'm a ninth grader and I'm taking this class and this is the first time I've ever seen this standard. So how do I, how do I, how do we as a district build that progression and prioritize so now teachers truly know what they're teaching and why they're teaching it rather than here's some standards, go teach them and there's no context of where the child has come from and where they're going to be going. I'm, I'm assuming this isn't really like new concepts, right? There always was math at each level. We kind of remember how we were taught math. Is this just um, more strategic and more correct? Yes. systematic? More correct. So year after year we build 
to get more complex with our teaching practices and expectations of students so that they're successful post Franklin High School. Okay. The standards are established though, right. statewide. Yep. Okay. We're basically, by stating prioritization, we're looking through data, quantitative and qualitative data, figuring out of the eight standards that we have in the state of Wisconsin where we're truly lacking. Correct, correct. What are we doing well at? Because we do well at a lot of things, but where are the areas that we need to focus to improve on? And let's prioritize around those, but not forget about what we're doing well. Anything else? I think that's it. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Item 9B is the District Administrator Goals. Dr. Miller. about the district goals and my goals um, by kind of putting them in a gallery and sharing my thoughts through some pictures today. So in order to lead our district in accomplishing the important goals we set for our students, I need to convey to our entire community my vision. This, this first picture is of a tiny house. One of my favorite shows on TV right now is that show, Tiny House Building. Um, one evening when I was watching it, I thought about actually how it relates to my vision for Franklin Public Schools. If you've never watched the show, it's about people and families that choose to severely downsize their life and live in a tiny house. Sometimes it's larger than no, no more than 100 square feet. If you had to describe their vision, it would be live simple. But when you watch this show, you see that behind living simple are some really big ideas. Living simple happens when big ideas about innovation, efficiency, and flexibility are carefully planned for. To live simple, you need to enjoy autonomy, have a strong sense of purpose and integrity to stand up for what you believe in. My vision's a little like the tiny house because it's simple. Get better. But like the big ideas behind the tiny house, there are big ideas behind what it means to get better. I believe that to get better, we all need to embrace a growth mindset. We need to promote an environment of risk taking. We need to be willing to change and provide both autonomy and support in accomplishing our district mission and vision. My vision for Franklin is about making it a better place to learn, a better place to work, and a better community. As I lead and as we set goals together, I've asked our team to focus on these three areas, which I would now like to tell you a little bit more about. Better place to learn. Looking at our district data, which is in this binder right here. <laughs> I've set forth the following targets for our district around being a better place to learn. Our ACT score, excuse me, we will have a graduation rate uh, of 100%. Our ACT score will get to 24. 70% of our students will score advanced or proficient in literacy and math on standardized measures and we will obtain a 65% engagement score 
on the Gallup Student Engagement Survey. To accomplish this, we will engage in thoughtful study of our curriculums and programs as part of a deliberate process which was just described to you by Mr. Royer and Mr. Cole. Better Place to Work will become a better place to work when we focus on customer service, being a collaborative and supportive place to work, and celebrating our success. Last May, we collected data to determine how Franklin employees feel about the work we do. I would like to share that information with you now. So, oops, we'll go this way. I have to open another link. Let's take a second here. <coughs> In spring of 2017, we worked with a company called School Perceptions to conduct a staff survey. Um, School Perception is an organization we've worked with before. Um, they were founded in 2002 and they provide um, independent and unbiased research. They've done a lot of surveys, they work a lot with school districts, um, and as you can see, they've helped over more than 400 districts uh, navigate the strategic planning and referendum process as well. So what we know is that when staff is engaged at work, that will increase student achievement, student engagement, which will uh, increase student achievement or student outcomes. <coughs> so the staff survey we did was conducted in May, and the reason for doing it was to create a baseline. I was new in this position, I am new in this position, it was important to me to understand what is our starting point. All staff members received um, a survey invitation via email. They had a unique access code by which they could fill out the survey. And we had a very good response, 73%, uh, uh, 438 employees. So I will share with you now the respondent information. So this um, bar graph, hopefully everybody can see it. I think it's pretty dark. Um, indicates um, what location the employees uh, surveyed uh, that responded came from. You'll see a large majority of the employees, 31% uh, did come from the high school, but that makes sense because we do have like 94 staff members there. What uh, best describes your position? A uh, large number of the individuals filling out the survey uh, were classroom teachers, but it also included um, our system specialist and pupil services staff. Uh, the number's a little hard to read. 15% were other support staff, food service, custodians, bus drivers, recreation employees. 15% were educational assistants, uh, office assistants and school secretaries. 4% were our technical, ed uh, technical specialists, perhaps our IT staff. 3% um, administration and 2% other. Uh, including the current year, how many years have you worked in the district? You'll see about half of the people who filled out the survey have 10 or more years, and then half of the people have less than that. So with regard to this first area uh, of planning uh, as a theme of the survey, um, the, the respondents were asked to provide um, what they thought were the highest priorities to them. So to provide a quality education for all students, please check a maximum of five of your highest priorities. You'll see that our highest priority among all of our staff here in Franklin is to better prepare students for life after high school, whether this be college or career. That's followed it by that is provide additional intervention support services for our struggling students. Third was develop innovative programs to improve student learning. Then uh, receive training, development opportunities to enhance skills. And finally, increase the number of hands-on project-based learning opportunities. So of all of our employees that responded, these were the top five priorities for them. And I'll just give you a second so you can look down the, the remainder of the list. So 
So questions about change readiness, and you'll see the survey is a one, two, four, and five, and that is a kind of a forced choice. Um, it's set up that way, so you can't choose something in the middle of the row. Um, and with regard to the average scores, um, the areas that fall be below 2.5 are areas that we would definitely want to focus on. In my mind, any area that falls below three is an area that we need to clearly pay attention to. So in this, in this area, um, our district is committed to making needed improvements as they are identified. Um, okay, but we, we may want to think about and consider um, how we strive to achieve consensus on areas of need for improvement, um, how we evaluate our new initiatives, and having a, a culture of more open dialogue. With regard to student achievement, um, really strong score with regard to providing a high quality academic program. Our employees believe that to be um, a very strong area for us. I won't read all of the areas, but um, again, the, the area at the bottom, student discipline is handled in a consistent manner by all staff, is definitely an area to pay attention to. <coughs> With regard to engagement, our employees do feel that their work contributes to their success of the district. It's a very high score. They find their job personally satisfying. They're proud of the district. And overall, these scores are um, <coughs> in the, within the average range. We may want to think about the amount of work that I'm asked to do is reasonable. Communication. Overall, um, I have a good understanding of the goals of the district. These all scored three. The lowest score is I feel comfortable sharing my ideas and opinions. How would you rate communication from our custodians and maintenance staff? They rate it well. Um, technology services. Um, the other areas I, I would definitely need to explore further um, what the question was on the survey and uh, what it is we're doing um, in terms of uh, why the rating was as such. So these are areas to kind of look more deeply into with regard to communication from food service principals, district administration, and the school board. Uh, with regard to culture, uh, my coworkers are willing to help me when I have a, uh, a heavy workload. That's a really positive thing to see. Overall, these areas were good. Um, the last area, having adequate opportunities to participate in decisions that affect me, is again an area that relates to some other areas that we've already seen in the survey that we should definitely be paying attention to. So the academic expectations of our students, this is an interesting piece of data. 69% um, of our employees believe their expectations of the students um, are just right. But we have almost an equal number of people who say they are too high or too low. Um, so that is interesting data that we do need to think about and consider. So back to work environment, there's two slides for this category. Um, overall, we get very high scores on the, on the work environment here in Franklin. Again, this is page two regarding work environment. The last area being, um, I have enough time to do my job effectively. Again, this, this relates to some other data we're seeing and something we would want to pay attention to. Health and wellness. It was interesting that our employees generally believe they engage in uh, healthy nutritional practices. So maybe there's not as many treat days at the school and they're eating a little better. I'm not certain about that. Um, but certainly the last area is one that we would want to and will pay attention to. The pace of implementing new initiatives is appropriate. 
that would be an area to focus on. Development and recognition. Um, I receive credit and recognition when I do a good job. Again, an area I think we should take a look at. Compensation and benefits. My benefits are competitive with similar jobs I might find elsewhere. It was an, uh, a score that would be considered um, okay. Um, but when you get down to pay practices are administered consistently for all employees, that is not thought of necessarily as uh, something they agree with. It's definitely not. <coughs> Building leadership. My principal is an effective leader. The score was good. So overall, um, trust in the leadership at the building level is good. The superintendent district administrator presents a positive image to the community. Um, that would have been Dr. Pats. District administration is responsive to major concerns of employees. I think that's an area to pay attention to, and then the one above it as well. District administration is consistent when administering policies concerning employees. So things to definitely think about and trust in district leadership. With regard to the school board, the school board presents a positive image to our community balances the mission with the fiscal responsibilities. Scores are good. Overall satisfaction, our community supports education. That's a very strong response there. Overall, um, all things considered, it's a good place to work. And then uh, below, the last one um, has improved in the past year. That, that is not a very high score, so something definitely to look at. So what grade would you give us? Uh, our employee groups uh, give us a B. 50% uh, of them say we are a B. You can see where the other um, respondents uh, believe we're an A or a C, D, or 2% an F. How would you rate the district compared to neighboring public school districts? This data somewhat correlates to the ABC <coughs> data that you saw on the previous slide. Most of the employees think we're better, and then the next uh, response would be the same. So just in summary, um, here are the things I've highlighted that we do need to, to, to focus on. We need to work on achieving consensus, evaluating our new initiatives, and making sure our district has a culture of open dialogue. We need to have more conversations about student behaviors. Workload is an area that we need to monitor. We need to be aware of how comfortable everyone is in sharing their ideas and opinions. This data indicates that there needs to be uh, more communication at, from the district level. Um, we need to monitor how involved employees are in decisions. Over one-third of the employees are evenly split in believing expectations are either too high or too low. I think we need to investigate that further. Slightly over half of the employees would like more time to do their job. The pace of new initiatives is affecting health and wellness. We need to consider how we are recognizing employees for doing a good job. Our employees believe their pay is competitive, but question if it's fair based on their responsibilities. <coughs> District administration needs to build more trust. And then nearly half of the employees believe we did not improve last year. So these are, uh, in summary, the, the focus points. So if you would just allow me now to return to my presentation. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to move forward. Becoming a better community is about engagement and support. 
As we become a better place to learn and a better place to work, we are contributing to the community. But we need to be more deliberate about that. We need to find new opportunities to reach out to the community. One way we have done this is to engage our youth in apprenticeship opportunities. This year, we plan to significantly increase the number of student internships in the community. In moving forward with our planning to be a better place to learn, better place to work, and a better community, I have conveyed to our staff three important operational principles to ground their decisions in. As a district, we need to make decisions that make us better tomorrow than we are today. We need to make decisions that are in the best interest of kids every day. And if we're going to change something, that change is the result of study and action. And these principles um, have been discussed and, um, with the staff and continue to be brought up as they work together to build their goals. The goals set for our district are the result of a careful analysis of data. This just shows the DPI site. This is the actual data for the district. This data includes our standardized test scores, but it also includes our formative assessments of cultural data. Last Friday, each building participated in a process in which they looked at school-wide data to draft a uh, school learning outcome. Then they looked at very specific student data to establish student learning outcomes. And then they came back together to write their final draft of their school learning outcome. So it was this broad process in which they looked at data very closely and came back to designing what they believe is the best goal for their building. These building goals have contributed to my goals as the district administrator. Looking at the building and the district data around a better place to learn, better place to work, and better community, each school is creating a school improvement plan that consists of two academic goals around better place to learn, a goal around improving school culture, and a goal around uh, engaging with the community. Utilizing this input, I've established the following goals for the 2017-18 school year. So the district goals. By June 2018, all schools will meet the goals of their school improvement plan. So within each building are the plans that help us take all of this data and move, move our achievement forward. My, my role is to make sure that that happens. In May of 2018, the school perceptions data, all those slides you just saw with data about how our employees feel about working here, will show a 10% increase in building trust level trust and a 15% increase in district level trust. By June 18 of 2018, the district will increase engagement and community partnerships. My goals personally are by June of 2018, I will be rated overall as effective or highly effective in the main areas of the professional practice rubric that you're about to see. In June 2018, all administrators will receive support, feedback, and a summative evaluation around professional practice goals that support a better place to learn, a better place to work, and a better community. So I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to share with you my goals, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Dr. Miller, on that last slide, um, for the district goals, it, you said at the building level you wanted to increase 10 and 15 percent, mm -hmm. the, the trust. Mm -hmm. How do you foresee implementing that process mm -hmm. right away? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the goal, but... right. So each building in their school improvement plan has coming up with their own plan to improve the school culture. So they, all the teachers, um, and the people in the building have seen this data. So they've had time to talk about what they want to focus on from the data. And 
it isn't, it, there's, there's many things within this survey that I think if we work on them, we'll build trust. So um, <coughs> that, that, that's the approach. I guess that's why I'm at, with, with all the, the highlighted issues mm -hmm. you had from the survey, mm -hmm. I, I was just wondering, I understand the building level goals, but mm -hmm. do you have first steps personally well, personally, myself, for yeah. building trust. Um, well, being highly visible, of course, is going to be very important for me to build trust as the district administrator. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I need to work with the building principals and have mm -hmm. ongoing dialogue about their plan in their building around school culture and what they're doing, what they've chosen at that building level to work on and what they're doing and how they're progressing. I need to have ongoing conversations about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Were there two sets of goals? Have you had something in the beginning where there were some goals about getting better and then you had those at the end? What were the, the ones in the beginning so, of the presentation? So my vision is about getting better and the, the areas we want to get my vision is better place to learn is really the, the, the academic piece. Better place to work is making this a place of good culture for our employees. And better community is the result of honestly being a better place to learn and a better place to work. But it's about those partnerships that are really critical to our students as well. This is a specific question about the, the 100% um, graduation rate, right. does, does that include just our district or does that include the House of Correction also in that goal? Yeah, so um, that would probably not include the House of Corrections. I think it would be curious. difficult to um, attain, but certainly um, our students at Franklin High School. Okay, thank you. Judy, in regard to the 100% graduation rate, there's the new requirement of the civic exam. Mm -hmm. Did that prevent anybody from graduating yet? No. no. Good. I, and I know you had some other academic goals, but I noticed that in looking at some survey that the staff provided, mm -hmm. one was you know helping students that have difficulties learn. Mm -hmm. Was an area they want to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, would you? I guess um, we always talk about gaps, you know, mm -hmm. not everybody, we're leaving some kids behind. Mm -hmm. And I know we, you have that program area for supports that might address <laughs> that, but no goals around, have we ever, want, have we ever considered tackling sure. that very directly and specifically? Absolutely. Um, there are goals being developed at the building level that do exactly that, that close the gaps. So um, there, may, there is one that I read today about doing that very thing, closing those gaps. And then at the grade level, they look at the data for the children at that grade level and talk about the strategies and ways in which they'll close those gaps. Okay, thank you. Yes. It's a great segue, Judy. I think at some point it would be great to be able to have visibility to the building level goals or their, their community plan within the mm -hmm. building. I think it would be educational, I think, for most of us to mm -hmm. understand how that differs building to building right. um, and to find the similarities within the district, I think. Right to share that. It was important to me that the process be more bottom up, meaning look at the data of the, around the children at each building and determine what what is needed instead of the district setting one goal that everybody's trying to reach because frankly the students perhaps at Robinwood are really good at that already. But what Robinwood needs to work on might not be the same as what Country Dale needs to work on and what Pleasant View needs to work on. So um, it's, it's been a real bottom-up <coughs> process in terms of really focusing on areas of need, building level. But I'd be happy to share that with you, but you will see very diff some differences there. Thank you. Are those building goals um, posted anywhere? Is that something that was ever given any thought? Because I think that might really help tie in, that community tie-in piece. Mm -hmm. you, every time you walk in a building, you see what those building goals are. Mm -hmm. and, Teachers are buying in, parents are buying in, and everyone's, you know, mm -hmm. focused on something like that. That might be something to consider. I see a lot of heads going like this, so. <laughs> sure. Uh, any other questions? 
Thank you very much for your work Thanks. on that. Appreciate it. Item 9C is the District Administrator Evaluation Process Ad Hoc Committee Report. And I have that going to Dr. Miller first. Is that what you wanted or to um, uh, Mr. Mr. Gamble, Gamble and Mr. And Lewis? Mr. Lewis have that okay. report today. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> um, we met twice to the, uh, first to investigate what's going to be a good method of evaluation for the district superintendent. Um, and the first meeting we were tasked with bringing our ideas to the table. What do we want to start fresh with? And that meeting was far more productive than expected. Uh, and we ended up bringing that uh, New York Council of um, School Superintendents model evaluation looking through it, discussing it, we actually realized that is not a bad benchmark as a starting point to be able to tailor something that our district can use. And we, it covers key areas um, and the task came developing a rubric that would gauge the performance they want being evaluated. So in our second meeting, Dr. Miller, Mr. Lewis and myself, we looked at evaluating the potential of a proposed rubric and based on the ability to have something meaningful for that evaluation for the district superintendent, needed to be objective, have annual goals, and provide performance feedback. So we took that into consideration, and we also looked at the 360 degree evaluation <clears throat> and a process for implementing that going forward. So in the end, we came up with an objective evaluative system that allows for comments that can elaborate for feedback details and um, it's drafted as an implement implementation plan for the board to review and hopefully that will be approved. To go through the documentation here, um, if you click on the council superintendent model evaluation, as Mr. Gamble noted, um, this was kind of the groundwork we, we took into account kind of the stage one analysis of all of the data that's out there from private sector, what, what are individual companies doing in terms of their evolution of employee management systems. Um, the council, you know, in, in lieu of um, doing the paralysis by analysis type look at rubrics, and everyone hears rubrics so often, but if we truly focus on the levels and, and items of, um, of evaluation in the rubrics that are included in the New York um, Council Super and, uh, School Superintendents, I think that's it's a great uh, building block in which Dr. Miller kind of took that to build a specific model, um, a bit more simplified, which I think is is probably necessary from what we have seen recently about what the previous survey was. So, um, an in-depth review of that document, which is quite lengthy, would at least lead you to the second document I would point you to, which is the Board of Education. District Administrator Evaluation Process Ad Hoc Committee Meeting Discussion Points from August 15th and September, September 19th. That individual document rolls through um, the process looking at the tools, a timeline of when a proposed evaluation process would take, um, in addition to um, the council standards that a superintendent has reviewed and the key um, key uh, descriptors that are tied to each one of those standards. So of, and, and Dr. Miller can roll through this detail if, if need be, but each one of those eight standards that are identified in that second page of the document are incorporated in her, um, in the individual uh, evaluation rubric, simplified from eight to five rubric areas, but each one of those subject areas is covered in the subsequent rubric area. Um, the third document I would point your attention to would be the District Administrator Professional Practice Rubric. This is the actual, oh, and, and Dr. Miller, you did uh, put the separate sections that are touched in each one of the, the five edited rubric areas. So you'll see AASA standards number two and number four, for example, on the first page. That correlates to the New York standard. So each page, each section of that rubric um, touches on one of those eight standards. So basically, if we take, boil this up to a 10,000 foot view, we have the five section area of this rubric that we would rate Dr. Miller on. Um, 
on a specific smaller portion that would relate to her uh, relations with the board and with the community. Um, for example, rubric section A is relationship with the board. That's broken up into five subcategories of information, materials, and background, board questions, policy involvement, and board development. Each one of those areas would then be rated based on that rubric as ineffective, developing, effective, or highly effective, and that rating would be tallied across every single one of us with an overall rating um, that Dr. Miller can use um, as qualitative and quantitative data because we would have common sections as well. Um, so that's an example of each one of those five sections um, that's boiled up from the eight sections from the New York survey. Uh, and then prior to answering any questions, the last document I would point you to is the 360 degree evaluation um, document which touches on the process that Dr. Miller has outlined, which would, um, if you can see the, the board evaluation um, heading, it includes all administrators, 10% of all certified staff, approximately 40 people district-wide, and 10% of all support staff, approximately 20 people um, district-wide, and that would be sent from Mr. Milzer uh, to uh, randomized selection of staff. Uh, so it would not be um, as has previously been done, a hand-picked group of, of folks, it would be truly random, um, and it would not be coming from Dr. Miller directly, but rather from Mr. Milzer, um, with any questions being directed to Mr. Milzer rather than Dr. Miller. So it's a true one step, um, should be considered almost a one over one type 360 evaluation, which is um, hopefully the most anonymous and, and would um, promote at least accurate and honest opinion if, if the board is going to be doing the evaluation um, just throwing this out there should Janet be involved in choosing some of the people who are going to get the 360 evaluation when, when we focused we tr truly wanted to get that randomized opinion we didn't want to say okay let's hit every single building administrator this year next year we'll or, or three out of the six this year, and next year we'll hit the other three. We wanted it to truly be random across the district based on those three categories of all administrators and supervisor uh, positions, 10% of all certified, and 10% of all not, uh, support staff not certified. Can I ask how you determined 10% of certified staff and support staff? So we, we touched on this briefly, and, and I asked the same question is, uh, you know, Normally, a 360 is either limited or it's global. Mm -hmm. um, it's either available for everyone to take, and in that case, um, the amount of data and information and comments that would come through might make it overwhelming to actually get through. Um, so if we looked at, out of the um, approximately 500 plus employees in the district, to get a represent representative sample of almost 10% of all employees, I think is a number that not only gets you 50 plus, it gets you uh, enough quantitative data to be able to see some trends. Mr. Milzer, how, how do you think you would go about a random selection? Um, we'd probably just use a, a software program to pick that, uh, probably through employee number by group. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, as far as the rubric, uh, I just, I really think this is going to be very effective compared to what we previously had. Um, is this rubric exactly what will be sent out to us then in the survey? And the, the content, yes, the format we're going to have to work with That's trying to figure out yeah. what's the best, uh, if, it's, if it's a free survey monkey and, and basically trying to design that survey around the rubric, um, but that's, the content won't change. So just off, I'm reading this right. So as far as the 360 degree, 100% of all administrators and supervisors and 10% of the certified staff and support staff. That's what you're looking for every year? No. Okay. And if you scroll down to the second page, that's actually the this, this survey, the questions um, or the content that will be sent out. So of the five rubric areas, the rubric relating to staff relations and instructional leadership, are the two areas that are pertinent to having staff comment on. The board relations, for example, um, there would be no valuable input that someone could provide based on the on Dr. Miller's relationship with us and vice versa. 
Um, so those two areas are identified as the relevant content areas for staff involvement and input. As far as the timeline um, for 27-18, it's obvious we do need to change the timeline. Um, in policy, if I recall, that's administrative rule, correct? So we don't have to change correct. policy? Yep. Okay. So the, the actual on that page, the under that timeline, we are currently following that timeline, but that is the the expected timeline of, um, for example, in September, Dr. Miller finalized her uh, her goals, and um, we're pending tonight going to meet the finalization of the district administrator evaluation process. So um, under that first step. She does a self-evaluation based on goals and the professional practice for work, or are you just she just doing a self-evaluation self-evaluation on her goals, or are you also doing one on the, the rubric? So what I would be doing is I would be providing you evidence of things that I've done to um, that relate to the professional practice rubric. So if you look at the January timeline, it's almost as that touch point of where are we related to those goals um, ahead of behind a self-identified schedule, as Dr. Miller has kind of laid out. Um, April, same thing would be an update and, and the administration of the 360. Again, with the timeline of Dr. Miller for 2018-19, would you have your goals ready by the old timeline, or did you prefer September? I'd have to look at the old timeline to see what they were. I don't recall. Um, well, I don't even believe it was in that was in our policy, but okay. we used to get those in May or June. Okay. So, well, as, as long as I have feedback, you know, the, the data around student performance isn't available at that time. So it's it's difficult to set the academic goals without the data. That's what I was thinking, especially if you right. want the buildings right. involved. Right. So we could look at that and talk about that further. You mean in terms of the 18-19 timeline? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and having the goals presented from me in September. I can't remember what it said in policy and no, administrative rule. I don't about believe that. it said anything about okay. when the goals had to be presented. Okay. So um, I think that's fine if we can continue to do them in September. I think that by December though, according to that timeline, you have to have some feedback on my performance. Yeah. What what kind of impact does the summer months have on achieving goals? Are you preparing diversely? Well, or I can in general the work that's being done in sure. the summertime. How does well, that impact the goals? Right. So there's a lot of planning that's done during the summer, and a lot of our leadership team is still here, and that's a big part of my role, is to work with the leadership team. So they are working, but they don't have their goals at that point. So, right? The goals are in September. So there's work being done on last year's goals, or right. So we look at data all the time. It's a continuous process. So in summer, we're doing our planning for next year. To some extent, we're doing that in spring already for next year, based on what we're learning from our data, both you know quantitative and qualitative data. So then uh, we're looking for a motion to approve the new district administrator evaluation. Uh, I don't know, do we want to call it a process for the motion? Process. Process. Yeah. We hear that motion. So moved. Motion by Mr. Lewis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gamble. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing on all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much for all of your work. Looks good. Yeah. Looks good. Item 9D is the Forest Park Middle School construction report. <coughs> Mr. Milzer. Well, the excavation and site work has begun. Uh, you can see the fences out there, the enormous pile of dirt on the corner there. Uh, that's all topsoil. 
uh, which the majority of it has been sold and is currently being trucked away. They'll leave the amount that we need for the site there. Uh, they've started working on forming the bioretention basins uh, out there as well. Uh, and uh, next week, they'll start on uh, underground uh, plumbing as well as the um, getting the footings in uh, and the foundations uh, and the perimeter, the pads, uh, forming those up. And then we'll start seeing a lot of uh, concrete trucks coming in. Uh, and that'll probably be uh, six weeks, eight weeks, something in that range uh, that they'll be working on that. Uh, so they've been at it every day. They're, they're hitting it hard now that the, we've gotten the start. Um, it's exciting to see. Where are they entering the site from the south side parking south side of the parking lot? They're entering directly from the road. Forest Hill. Oh, okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So, how much revenue does a mountain of soil generate? Uh, I'm not sure because we don't receive the Us, revenue. None, yeah. You get you get a uh, a lower price on your excavation work because they're able to get some revenue out of it. Although if we could have sold it by the bushel, I think it's very expensive. <laughs> Any questions? How often do you find yourself over there? I mean, you just give it, you've been gone for a couple of weeks, so probably not much. I've been gone way. for a couple of weeks, but I, it's one of those things that I'll be, I'll be over there daily, seeing what's going on. And when the uh, trailers become established, I'll be over there quite often. Mark as well. Uh, Mark definitely. Mark is uh, currently in, uh, he was in a meeting all day today uh, on a bid package uh, and then half a day tomorrow as well. And then we'll be having weekly to bi-weekly meetings uh, with them out in their trailers to make sure, you know, if there's any decisions that need to be made, how things are going, uh, talking to the contractors, that kind of thing. Are we able to get a soft timeline? <coughs> Construction updates? Uh, like what the end date is or, or just it doesn't have to be like the construction timeline but something to basically show us month Front to month target. what what work is being performed uh, yeah we could probably put that together we have uh, our our end date is uh, currently uh, the end of January of 19 I think is where we're projecting right now uh, but I don't have any detail on you know, what what pieces mm -hmm. would go on then, but we can do that. Are we planning like a any, up. any like a camera on the site or a little fly around or something that the community can watch it go up? Uh, right. They they have that, and I think uh, they were looking at uh, putting together a video for us when it's done that would show uh, a time lapse of it coming up, starting the work, and, and being finished. But the original start date, we missed that by quite a bit, didn't we? Right. And right. that start date would have gotten us into the winter maybe a little farther along. Do, do they see additional delays being developed? Um, I don't think we'll have additional delays. We're probably about a month late at this point uh, from what they had projected because there was a little bit of extra time in there. Uh, but from a budget standpoint, they had planned on providing heat all winter long to keep working. So it, that didn't change. So the function of the weather is really going to determine how well they do. Right. OK. All right, thank you very much. Item 9E, the treasurer's report, is available in the board docs library. Item 10, future agenda items, we have the enrollment staffing report on October 11th, the annual health report and at-risk report October 11th, community education and recreation report October 11th, and the 2017-18 budget update and approval <coughs> on October 25th. Uh, item 11, school board meeting debriefing. Any comments? I would just make a note pending any discussion between Dr. Miller and our directors uh, on related to the art community comment that that might potentially be a, an agenda item if need be. 
You mean a report back? Yes. Okay. okay. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Mr. Nielsen. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Wachowski. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned at 724 p.m.